Through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already come. You have been faithful. And from the depths of our despair, you always lift us up. We are there is a way that others see you. And where you go from this point forward in your life is going to depend on which mirror you believe. I got all these mirrors in my house that are messed up. And I know they're messed up because they keep showing me my beard is supposed to be black. But I look in those mirrors and they're messed up. They're defective. I'm going to take them back to the store because they keep showing me these gray patches. Like I'm 40 years old, and I started rebuking mirrors in my house, you know? These lines coming up under my eyes, and I'm like, You are a liar like your father the devil. I cast you back to the pit of hell where this is accurate. How many ever looked in a messed up mirror? How many ever have people around you that made you feel a certain way about yourself? When Moses was coming into his identity and assignment, he had to deal with the fact that he was really living with two different images of who he was. And remember, God is using Moses to deliver the Israelites out of this Egyptian oppression. And when Moses first, first starts to act on his impulse, he does the right thing, but he does it the wrong way. He defends his people, but he does it by murdering an Egyptian. So he's ahead of his time, and he's out of his zone. But he's doing the right thing, but he still doesn't know who he is yet. And it's difficult for him because he doesn't really fit in with either group that he's living with. The Hebrews are the people he was born from. The Egyptians are the people that he was raised by. But he identifies more with the people that he was born from than the people he was raised by. So he doesn't really fit in. And when you don't really fit in to either group, you end up running. That's what happened to Moses. He, he confronted an Egyptian who was beating a Hebrew one day, and he killed him and buried him. But then the next day, he went out and saw two of his brothers fighting, and he was like, break it up, guys. You know, We're suffering enough from them. We don't, we don't have to kill each other. And this is in Exodus chapter 2. I want to show it to you real quick. You got it? Exodus 2. The man said back to him, who has made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you have killed the Egyptian? And then Moses was afraid and thought, surely the thing is known. And he ran. He ran. We don't really see him in his next uh, stage of his assignment until 40 years later. He ran because he was too Hebrew to be an Egyptian and too Egyptian to be a Hebrew. And when you don't really fit in with either, you don't know who you are, and you spend years of your life running from who you really are, looking in the mirror of your last mistake. He ran and he ran and he ran. And see, the question is the right one. He said, who made you? Who made you? But if you don't know that, you will hand other people your mirror to show you who you are. And let me tell you something about people. People would rather define you by your worst mistake. What's crazy about Moses is he killed a man, and there's only one verse in the Bible about the murder. Now, if you let church people write the Bible, they would have had a whole book about it would be called the book of Moses' murder, the book of Moses' mistake, the book of Debbie's divorce, the book of your lowest moment. But maybe God doesn't see you through the lens of your mistake. Maybe he sees you through the lens of his grace. Maybe when he looks at you, he sees the finished work of Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought about the fact that if they didn't make you, they can't define you? My maker is my mirror. I promise I'm trying to be as calm as I can be. 
But when God showed me that, my maker is my mirror. He showed me Moses standing in front of the burning bush, and, and God's like, I'm going to use you. You're going to be the one to do it. You're the one who's had the conflicted identity and so many mistakes, and you don't even really believe in yourself. And, and so I was thinking about you and, and how you might be standing in front of something that God is speaking to you and is burning on the inside, but you can't really locate yourself because, honestly, you don't fit into either group. You don't really fit in with really churchy people because they are so perfect and they pray so much and they make Bible verses out of their kids' sandwiches before they pack them in the lunchbox. Numbers 1331, cut out with scripture stencils and pack it in the lunchbox like the fish and the loaves and the little boy. And you are not churchy enough, but you're really not worldly enough because the Spirit of God is on the inside of you when you try to sin, telling you that you're something greater than that. And you're kind of righteous, but you're kind of ratchet. And you're, 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 you're kind of a worshiper but you're kind of worldly, and you kind of worry, but you kind of worship, and you're kind of organized, but you're kind of chaotic, and you're kind of powerful, but you're kind of petty, and you come on, I'm preaching to somebody, and you're a little bit of both, and your self-concept is in development, and this is when it's very important who holds your mirror, because if the wrong people show you, you get a distorted image of yourself, and then you start matching in your life what you see in your mind. That's what, that's what Moses did. God's like, all right, got a job for you to do. I'm going to use you. I'm going to give you everything you need. Cool? Moses is like, uh, but uh, but uh, but uh. But see, the thing about me… Watch, watch what he says. This is Exodus 4.10. It's which mirror you're looking at, right? So if you look at the mirror of what you're missing, and you only see what's not there, that's what Moses did. He's like… He, he goes, Oh, my Lord. This is in Exodus 4.10. OMG, he says. OML. He's like, I'm not eloquent. I am not eloquent. It's funny because I got the scripture on the back screen right now, and it's got a typo in it. It says, I am eloquent. He said the opposite. That's what he said right there. I am not eloquent. And you really have both voices. That's, that's kind of how it feels, right? Like one is saying I am, and one is saying I'm not. And I don't know which one. <laughs> I got this thing on the inside of me that feels like I can do it, and I'm supposed to do it, and I'm going to make it, but I got this other thing saying, and I don't know which way to look. So he said, I'm not eloquent. And then he says, either in the past or in the last five minutes, <laughs> nothing has changed since you started speaking. It's still the same. I got saved, and my nose is still big. I got saved, and I'm still kind of cross-eyed, and I read slow. I got saved, and I still don't feel intelligent enough. I got saved, and I still got memories. I got saved, and I love God, but I still got trauma. I got saved, and I love God, but I'm still limited by my experience." He said, um, I'm, not, I'm not what you think I am. God's answer is so instructive. Next verse. The Lord said, who has made? Who made your mouth? Who made your brain? Yeah, but I'm just weird. What if the world is weird and we're the normal ones? Y'all don't like it. I got to be careful who I look at when I preach, by the way. Because you're like a mirror. Oh, they put this. Now, Chris, Chris, is Chris Brown around? If he's around, bring him back up. Come on, come on. When the worship leaders are leading, they don't know this, but there was a choir out here today at Ballantyne, and they were standing on these risers. And um, if Chris isn't coming, you'll have to do. Okay. So, LJ, they think that they're just up here singing. Yeah, come here, come here, come here. I'll tell both of y'all. We could teach a whole thing on this. Can y'all still see me back here? Because I want to tell this to them. One time they dis they discovered 
that a lot of primates and all humans are softwired with mirror neurons. So our brains actually experience the same emotion that somebody we're watching, if we're tuned into them. And they got it from a monkey that was watching a man open a nut. And they had, a, they had it hooked up to his brain, and they saw the same brain activity in the monkey's brain that was in the man's brain who was opening the nut. And they realized that all humans are wired in such a way with mirror neurons that I experience your reality by watching you experience it. So this is why when a parent gets mad, kids can feel that stuff. They can feel that tension. It's called a mirror neuron. Here's what was happening while you were singing, this is how I fight my battles. Somebody out there was going through a battle, but they've been feeling like they were losing. But God put you out here as a mirror. So now all of a sudden, they didn't feel victorious this week. But when they saw you worshiping God, don't run from me, I got you by this leather coat. When they saw you worshiping God, they didn't feel like they had the victory. But while you were shouting the victory, now I wonder if you would do that for somebody on your row right now. I know you had a hard week too. But magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. If you don't have faith today, borrow mine. You're going to make it. I said so. It's called mirror neurons. And just as contagious as faith is, so is cynicism. So if you got cynical people holding up your mirror, you'll always feel small. You'll always feel smaller than your challenge, smaller than your giant, smaller than your addiction, because you're not looking at your God. But when your maker is your mirror, 344, 345, 346, I'm still counting. God's not done yet. His mercies are new with every rising of the sun. He who began a good work in me will be faithful to complete it. One thing about a mirror. It always shows you the image in reverse. God knows how your situation turns out. God knows how your story ends. God knows what he put in you. When this message flooded into my heart, I was like, it's going to change somebody's life because they've just been looking in the wrong mirror been looking at their mistakes. When your mistakes are your mirror, you stay on the outside of Canaan even though you have the strength to go in. Not because you are small, but because you see small. So the spies came back and they were like, hey Moses, remember Moses has dealt with rejection his whole life. And so a lot of times when when people don't accept you, it's because they have rejected themselves. Not all the time, a lot of times. And this is a really important point. Everybody's acceptance is not a blessing. Because the majority might be the wrong mirror. Ten out of twelve said, we can't go in. Ten out of twelve said they're too big. We went in. This is what they said. We went to the land, Moses, and they became the mirror for the millions of people who had a promise from God but hadn't possessed it yet. This is why it's so important. Who you're around, what you take in, what you look at, you become what you behold. So the people are giving a report, and they're like, um, it's a great place. The valleys are fertile. It's a rich land. We brought you back some grapes. Grapes were so big they had to carry them on poles. But then they stopped looking at God, start, start, stopped looking at grapes, and started talking about giants. And when they looked too much at the giants as their mirror, they saw themselves as grasshoppers. That's what they said. Numbers 13 33. They said, <clears throat> There were the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim. There were giants in the land, big, strong adversaries that we would have to dispossess to take the land. And we seemed to ourselves, wow, 
like grasshoppers, not to God. We seem to ourselves like grasshoppers. Most people see God really big. Even those who barely believe in God see him really big. It's not how big you see God, it's how much you believe that God is in you.